two, one, so trigonometric identities, and I'll try um, to give you some hints on how to actually go about and prove them. It's impossible for me to write down all the trigonometric identities. I'm gonna give you a few examples to try to show you and illustrate you know, how to go about these trigonometric identities, how to tackle them. Some of them are easier, some of them may be a little bit harder. But ultimately, you have to sit down and um, uh, try to prove them on your own. Now, of course, as you're watching this, you're most likely probably in kind of grade 10 or grade 11, and you're tackling these trigonometric identities for the first time. And it's not always easy. Not all students like them, um, but some students love them because they're kind of puzzles. I like them because it introduces students to kind of the proving method, right? Where you want to be able to show when a left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side, and then use some of the trigonometric ratios that you've learned about, and then apply them and kind of manipulate things. So it's almost like a puzzle, like a game um, that you wanna be able to solve and, and prove left-hand side equals right-hand side. Now, what are these trigonometric identities in general, right? Like, what do they mean? Um, so basically, they're just equations of trigonometric ratios where um, they're true for all the values of the angles that are provided or the inputs that are provided. Now, some of them are true completely by definition because we have defined uh, trigonometric ratios. So for example, you know, since you're kind of watching this, okay, so this in terms of definition, then you, know, you certainly should recall okay, all the definitions. For, for, for instance, you know, sine, of theta, you know that this, okay, is just the definition of opposite over hypotenuse, okay, in terms of the lengths, and I'm gonna start writing this as, you know, y divided by, let's say, the hypotenuse, um, which is going to be the radius r. And so for these, you know, when you studied kind of the um, unit circle, and you started to define these um, ratios for sine and cosines, you know, so what we had is, you know, if we have this unit circle, I mean, we did it for a unit circle. This is not exactly a perfect circle here. It's not centered, but I think you get the, the gist of it. So, you know, here we said that the, you know, if you had an angle and you were going all the, re all the way around the circle. Now, what I'm spinning around really is just the radius of that circle, and we made it equal to one but it doesn't have to be one, right? It can be any radius. So that hypotenuse, let's say, you know, I called it R, okay, for the radius of that circle. And then the values, okay, you know, as you had, so this was your, you know, X value, okay, and these were your Y values. So if I would take out this triangle, let's say if I take it out of that circle, so this is what I mean. So that's your radius, this is your Y, and this is your X. And that was just by, definition of that trigonometric ratio for sine of whatever theta might be and theta is you know this angle right here that we have so that interior angle and you of course defined your cosine theta and you know so this was adjacent over hypotenuse it's kind of how we remember or if you do it in terms of the unit uh, circle or just a circle with a radius r it's going to be just x over the radius of that circle and then of course you can do the same thing for the tangent now this this is just a definition right of a ratio but in these trigonometric ratios what we started to do is we started to define them um, so for instance you know we would say that tangent so instead of writing tangent theta equals to opposite over um, adjacent you know, you would write it as sine of theta divided by of cosine of theta. And, you know, you have seen this if you've watched any of my kind of previous videos for the grade 11 series on these. But this, if you think about it, well, where did this come from? Well, this just comes from um, the definitions. So remember that 10 theta is just opposite over adjacent right? So that's your 10 theta. That's your left-hand side, okay, of the equation. Let me kind of remove this. And then your right-hand side of the equation, well, this is just sine theta over cosine theta. But what is sine theta? Well, sine theta was just simply opposite 
over the hypotenuse and cosine of theta is adjacent over hypotenuse and if you take this you know these two kind of ratios that you have this is just really a fraction the hypotenuse that just cancels off and all you really have so this is just equal to opposite over adjacent so your right hand side is equal to the left hand side so this would have been a trigonometric identity so we call it identity so they're equal to each other uh, but they're equal to each other actually by definition. So tangent is actually equal to sine over cos, right? Now, for some of these values, you know, tangent doesn't really exist because cos of an angle, so for example, at 90 degrees is equal to zero and you can't divide by zero. So you have to be careful with some of the um, identities that you have. Now, there are other definitions that we also had, you know, from sines and cosines. So for instance, you know, some other identities where, you know, we would say secant theta is equal to one over cosine theta. And that again was just by definition because it's just by reciprocal that we would say. We actually define secant theta to be um, equal to, so this in, in this case, it was just hypotenuse over adjacent, which is just one over cosine theta. And the same thing would happen. So if you would continue this, you know, you had cosecant theta. So that was defined as one over sine theta. So these are all defined by definitions. And you can do the same thing with cotangent. So these are all identities. This is an identity. This is an identity. This is a trigonometric identity where they're kind of equal to each other. And you can show it by just substituting, you know, going back to these, the triangles, and then the opposite over adjacents. And you can use for opposite, you can use, you know, the Y distance, okay, of that triangle. And then the um, uh, adjacent would have been just the X value. And then your actual hypotenuse is the radius, whatever radius you have. Now, one key thing here is for all of these identities, which I guess, you know, I should kind of stress to you, is that when you're working on these, these, ident these identities hold true for all the, all the values of the input. So all the actual um, thetas that you have. So for instance, you know, if you're going to define 10 okay, of theta, it's going to be sine of theta over cosine of theta. And it doesn't matter what theta is, except of course on the values where we just can't define cosine theta cannot be equal to zero. You know, so that's just a restriction. But for all other values, um, th this is always going to be true. And that's what a trigonometric identity is all about. It's an equation where your left-hand side is going to be equal to the right-hand side for all the values of whatever theta you have. Now, that angle, it, it doesn't matter what it is, except for the restricted ones, right, where we just can't define by zero. That's what a trigonometric identity is. So it uses these trig kind of ratios and then equates left-hand sides to right-hand sides. And then we're kind of stuck and we, we're trying to prove these um, as we go along. So, you know, a very common one, I actually um, did a, a derivation of this one already kind of for grade 10 purposes at the time. But here I'm going to just show you once again, you know, so if you had um, for instance, this identity, which is extremely, extremely common, it's sine theta, okay, squared plus cosine theta squared. Now, remember, the square doesn't go outside, it goes kind of right by the sine, and this is equal to one. So again, so what this, what this is, just the deja vu, okay, for you, this is, you know, how we actually are supposed to kind of write this thing. Okay, but we bring that square inside and this is where we put it. So that square okay, is ending up there. Now we don't really write it like this because it just takes too much time to write those brackets. So we always just write it in this way. All right, so I'm gonna avoid writing it like that, but just wanted to kind of remind you of this. Now, this is a trigonometric identity. So it has trigonometric ratios, it has sines and cos, and it is equal to um, one, right? So no matter what we do. Now, how would we go about in trying to prove this um, throughout? Um, so for this one, 
you know, so what you can do is you can take the left hand side, which is going to be this. Now the right hand side is just equal to one. So there's really nothing to show on that side. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the left hand side and I'll kind of will go back to the ratios themselves, right? So what is sine theta? Um, well, sine theta that I have is just simply opposite over hypotenuse, right? So opposite, so let's say y over hypotenuse, so in terms of the radius r of that circle, right? So that's what this equals. And this is squared. So plus, okay, now what is um, cosine theta? Well, cosine theta is adjacent over the hypotenuse. So that's going to be x, okay? And this is going to be over r, okay? So that's that. Um, squared. So that's my left hand side that I have in here. Now notice um, what I'm going to do is if I'm going to square this, all right, so what I'm going to, what I'm going to have is this is going to be y squared, okay, this is plus x squared, but notice the denominator is the same, it is r squared, right? Now what's y squared plus x squared? You know, where does this come from? You know, when you will remember um, I guess I should better, you know, draw a better triangle here, let's say. Okay, so something like that. So, you know, this was your x, you know, this was your y, this is your hypotenuse. So it's kind of the radius of that circle. And we're writing radius because we want it true for all the angles, right? So we want to go all the angles all the way around. That's what we want to be able to see. And now here, you know, your radius is just because it's a right angle triangle. Okay, this is r squared equals to x squared plus y squared, right? That's where that comes from um, because that's just the Pythagorean theorem. And so therefore, you know, so this, this r squared or this y squared plus x squared on top here, this just equals to r squared. So this is r squared over r squared, which indeed is equal to 1, which is your right-hand side. So indeed, your left-hand side is equal to 1, which equals your right-hand side. And that's how we would kind of go about and prove this identity. This is called a Pythagorean theorem uh, identity, okay, for these ratios. And it is true no matter what the actual angle is. You know, you can substitute those angles in, and then you'll see that this is always going to be the case. And that's what a trigonometric identity is. Now, we use this quite often. Um, and now, don't forget, because of this identity and how it is written, you can, you know, you can move things around. So you can say sine squared theta is equal to one minus cosine squared theta, right? So this is also the same identity. I just moved the cos squared on the other side. Or you can say, you know, cosine squared theta is equal to one minus sine squared theta. And you might say, well, look, okay, am I going to be remembering this? most likely you won't remember all of them. Now, this one you will. I bet you that you will and you actually should. You know, that the square of both of those ratios, sines and cos, is always going to be equal to 1, um, which is a good identity to remember. And then these, you know, this is just manipulation. Now, why would you need that? Because sometimes if you're working out a problem, maybe you are given the sine or maybe you're given the cos, and then you can use these identities um, to help you solve for the actual question, right? But in, you know, grade 11, when you're covering this, most of the time teachers will just kind of give you these, the, the explanation behind, and then they'll give you some identities so that you can test yourself and manipulate them to see if the left-hand side equals right-hand side. Now, when you're doing it in the moment, you're just saying, oh, these are just kind of silly puzzles. Why am I doing this? But turns out later on, as you carry on through math, some of these trigonometric um, identities and ratios are kind of super useful to be able to solve some problems. So that's why you're introduced to them a little bit later on, um, sorry, a little bit earlier than maybe you will need them down the line. Now, with these, you know, so I'm going to just show you um, a few of these identities, just kind of by example, and show you, you know, how I would approach solving and proving these. So ultimately your goal is going to be to show that the left-hand side equals right-hand side. And you can do it by relating it back to the original ratios. So something like this, you know, to the triangle where you're setting, 
you know, y, x, and r, so your opposite over adjacent or whatever it might be. Um, or you can directly use sines, cosines, tangents, whatever, secants and cosecants um, to your advantage. So let's try some examples so that you can get a taste for these identities. And unfortunately, beyond that, you yourself will have to sit and then figure out, you know, if these identities are true. Okay. So here is one example um, that I'm going to show. Now, I'll kind of I'll break these down as we're going through. So let me copy this. And some of the, these are easier. Some of them are a little bit harder. Um, so we'll try, you know, all of these, the one that I have posted. Now, these are not mine. Okay, you know, you can find them. I'm sure you can find many identities on the internet in books and so on. So it's not like I kind of just invented, right? I mean, I do sit down and I play around with it and just try to give you examples. But ultimately, you can find them in, in books and online, I'm sure, and many, many more than I have presented here. So here is a trigonometric identity. Um, so one of the first things that we try to do in these trigonometric identities we always just check for ourselves, you know, is something restricted? Like, are we not allowed to have um, something where this is just not going to be true for sure? And that goes back to just restrictions, right? You can't divide, so you can't have the denominators equal to zero. So that's something that you can check before you even attempt. So these identities might be true for almost all the values because maybe there's one or two um, values where you know you will have the denominator equal to zero. So for instance, here as I'm looking, you know I do remember. So for 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 instance, the secant, which is just one over cos, um, and since it's one over cos, so that means that we cannot have. Okay, so this cos okay theta cannot be equal to zero, and that's actually going to be also true for the tangent, right? Because tangent is sine over cos. Um, and that means that costs of theta cannot be equal to zero, right? So for whatever value that is. Now, cos of 90 degrees, for instance, is equal to zero, or cos of 270 degrees, right, is equal to zero. So those values just won't work in this identity. But let's see how we would prove it. So what I like to do is I typically might take the bigger side, so whichever side is bigger, and then I will try to show that it looks like the smaller side. So in this case, I have, here's my left-hand side of the equation. Here is my right-hand side of the equation. And my goal is to try to show them that they are equivalent. So I wanna to try to manipulate either left-hand side or the right-hand side and make it so that it looks exactly like the opposite side. So I'm gonna take, for instance, one plus 10 squared theta and try to see if it equals to secant squared theta, right? So let's see how that works. Okay, so now first, um, so secant, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, I'll take this, and I'm kind of just going through this, right? So this is one over, now this is sine squared theta all over, and this is gonna be cos squared theta, so that's just, by definition of the tangent. And so there you go, I'm using an identity already. Okay, so that, that is the left-hand side there. Now, um, so if I find a common denominator, okay, so for this, okay, so notice what this will be. So I'm just gonna say cos squared theta. Okay, so I am finding a common denominator for both of these. So I have this, so now I have put everything over cos theta. So that's that. Um, now, this right here that you see, whoops. So this right here, um, you will recognize. So this is actually you know one of those identities that I just mentioned to you that's kind of important. So that's this identity right here, right? Sine, sine um, squared plus cos squared is equal to one. I mean, this is cos squared plus sine squared, but that doesn't matter. So the top, so here, this just equals to one all over cos squared theta. But cos squared, one over cos squared theta is the definition of secant squared theta, which is exactly what we have on the right-hand side. So there you go. So I've just shown that indeed, 
1 plus 10 theta is equal to secant squared. Um, sorry, uh, 1 plus 10 squared theta is equal to secant squared theta. So that's how you would kind of manipulate. So what you're doing is you're taking and trying to see, okay, is this actually true? And then don't forget to, you know, set restrictions if there are any, um, just to avoid dividing by zero. So that's one example. Let's take a look at another example here. So I'm going to take this one. Now this one looks a little bit harder. So I'm going to copy this down. Okay, let's put it in here. And now, so again, so what, what are we going to do? So we have 10 theta is equal to all of this junk on the right hand side. So I'm going to, again, I'm going to try to take the, the bigger side and see if I can um, simplify it in some way and then show it that it equals to 10 theta. And okay, so, you know, so that's what I'll try to do. I do have to worry about restrictions. So again, so 10 theta um, just means that it's sine over cos, right? So again, so we're not going to allow to have cos of theta equal to zero. So we can't have that because then the 10, um, 10 uh, of theta is just going to be undefined. So that's one. Now on the right hand side, what I have is, so in the denominator, actually, the, so let me just take the denominator. I'm going to, I'm going to work on the right hand side. So let's see, uh, actually first, so notice what I'm going to do is I'm going to take out because I have sine common to both. So this is going to be um, that, right? So I took out the sine from both. Now I still have to worry about the denominator. I have cos. I'm going to take out cos theta. That's going to be 1 plus sine theta. Okay. So in the from the denominator, again, we can't have cos theta equal to zero, and we also cannot have one plus sine theta cannot be equal to zero, which means sine theta cannot be equal to negative one, right? So those, that's my restriction. So I guess, you know, that, that could happen at, um, you know, sine of 270 degrees. So that's, you know, at the bottom, if you remember your unit circle, okay? So that would have been negative one um, there. So those are my restrictions. And now, so here, notice this is going to cancel off with that. So that's gone. And indeed, so you have sine theta over cos theta, but this is just the definition of 10 theta. So you've just shown that the left-hand side indeed is equal to this right-hand side. So I've just manipulated that. That's what trig identities are kind of all about. So there's these little puzzles that you manipulate to show that the two sides are equal, all right? So that's example number two. So let's take a look and see what else they have here, okay, in terms of the examples. Um, so that was second one. Here is another one. This one looks more complicated. Copy. So it will force you to understand these ratios and kind of try to remember at least the definitions of them. All right, so here we go. So we have this. Um, so yes, so I will have restrictions, I guess. You know, again, the denominator. So we have cosecant. Remember, cosecant is one over sine theta. So we have to be careful there. So what I cannot have here is I cannot have cosecant theta plus one. This cannot be equal to um, uh, zero. Right? If you bring that one over to the other side, that means that cosecant theta cannot be equal to uh, negative one. All right, so that's what we would have had here. So this cannot be equal to negative one. It's one of the restrictions that we have. That's from the right-hand side there. Um, now from the left-hand side, it looks like the left-hand side is a little bit more complicated than the right-hand side. Okay, let's take a look and see. So I'm gonna to try to break it down. I'm already gonna to try to show the identity that the two sides are equal to each other. And then my restriction should come out because I'm already noticing it says cosecant squared theta minus one. Um, that's a difference of squares. 
So if you remember the difference of squares, you know, so when you had this x squared minus one, this is just x minus one and x plus one, if you remember that. So that's kind of what, we're, what I'm gonna use, okay, to simplify this. Okay, so let's take that left-hand side and start simplifying it. So in the denominator, so I already said, so I'm gonna have, so this is going to be cosecant, I'm gonna drop the theta, okay, because I don't wanna keep writing the theta. So I'll just write cosecant squared, um, sorry, I'm gonna put the difference of squares. So cosecant plus one, cosecant minus one, of course it's theta in there. So that's still equal. So what this tells me now from the restriction, I already have the cosecant plus one, uh, but I also have the restriction coming from cosecant theta minus one cannot be equal to zero. All right, and if you bring that um, negative one over, it's gonna, that means cosecant theta cannot be equal to one. Those would have been your two restrictions. Now in the numerator, this will take you a little bit of time, but I'm actually noticing, okay, so um, if you take, okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna try to show you. So here, this is squared, right? This is, so you have three terms here. Now, when you have a squared like that or something of that nature, what I, what I think about is in my mind, so right here, this is kind of like saying, I know this is not exactly it, but this is like co x squared minus, 3x where the cosecant is your x plus 2, right? So this is like a quadratic that you would have. So if you remember from quadratics, um, x squared minus 3x, I can actually um, factor this out. So this is going to be, so if I took this, this would have been x minus 2 and x minus 1. So if I would factor out that quadratic. So what I'm gonna use that, that x is your cosecant. So this is your cosecant, maybe maybe I should keep the theta just so that you, you see where, where all this stuff is coming from. And then cosecant theta minus one. All right, so I just factor out that numerator. So this is it. Now, if factoring this out, notice that this and this, sorry, and this will cancel. That's the cosecant theta minus one which oh which gives you the right hand side so this is going to give you cosecant theta minus 2 divided by cosecant theta plus 1 which is exactly the right hand side so that's your trig identity so you've just actually shown that the left hand side is equal to the uh, right hand side and you're done Okay, so that actually shows that these two are equivalent, and then those were your restrictions. So your restrictions were cosecant uh, theta cannot be equal to one, or it cannot be equal to negative one. All right, now cosecant is one over um, sine, right? So you can manipulate that uh, as well. Okay, so now, so those that's another trig identity that you have in there. Let's try another one, let's see, this one, copy. So as you see, these are just kind of puzzles that you're playing around and you're using all the different tools. I mean, notice I even use the quadratic, right? Factoring out um, tool that, you know, from way back, kind of grade 10-ish, to be able to use that and to show left-hand side equals right-hand side. Okay, so here, okay, so let's try it again. Uh, so what would this equal? Um, so which side? We don't have any denominators, so really there's nothing to worry about here in the denominators. Let's see what I can do here. These Both of these look like difference of squares, right? Let me take the right-hand side here. So I'm going to take the right-hand side instead of the left-hand side. And if I factor this, because the difference of squares, this is gonna be sine squared theta plus, uh, sorry, cos, right? So this is cos squared theta and sine 
sine squared theta minus cos squared theta. So again, this just come, this is like again like x to the four minus let's say you know you had something like this y to the four, and then you're doing a difference of square with that, right? Where your x I'm calling sine and and your your cos I'm calling y. Uh, no relation to the x and y in terms of the triangles, right? But just kind of going back here in terms of the factoring that you have learned in the past. Now, with this, well, sine squared plus cos squared, this is just equal to 1, right? That's an identity. So that means that the right-hand side, yeah, indeed, it equals to sine squared theta minus cos squared theta. So here you go. So here's the left-hand side equals to the right-hand side. Um, so you have that. So that's another identity. There's no restrictions in this one at all because there's no denominators to worry about for these ratios. Um, okay, so now next. So here's, a here's, I guess, the last one from here. So copy. I'm going to go down. To be honest with you, I kind of like playing these games and then seeing what to do. Oh, this one looks rough. Um, okay, so, well, first things first, we're not allowed, what are we not allowed here? Sine, cos, those ones are fine. Tangent, okay, so the restriction from tangent, so that means, because it's tangent is sine over cos, so that means cos theta cannot be equal to zero. Right, so we have that. Um, from the left-hand side, 1 minus sine squared theta, so that cannot be equal to 0. Okay, well, let's, let me write that down, that restriction. So 1 minus sine squared theta, so this cannot be equal to 0. Now if I manipulate this, this is going to be that. Okay, which means, so if you take the square root of both sides, well, square root of 1 is going to be you know, plus minus 1. So we have to be careful there. So sine theta. Okay, so sine theta cannot be um, 1 or it cannot be negative 1, which should make sense because if it was negative 1 and you substituted it in and you squared it, it would have gave you 1 and you would have had 1 minus 1, which is 0. Okay, so those are my restrictions coming there. Those ones are typically, you know, students kind of just want to show the identity and they forgot forget the restriction. Depending, sometimes your teachers might be, um, they might want to know what the restrictions are. I guess I kind of would as well. And maybe you'll lose a mark or something like that if you forget the restrictions. So, you know, don't, don't forget about those. And then now we can tackle this. Now tackling this, let me move this junk out of the way here. Sorry, I'm going to make this smaller. I don't know which side to pick here, to be honest. I always like starting with the bigger side, but the only thing I notice on the left-hand side, which is the bigger side, I'm noticing that all the ratios, so all the signs, um, they're actually, sorry, the, the, they're all signs, right? It's, I'm all using sign here. So this is sign, this is sign, this is sign. So it's everything is with respect to sign. And then the right-hand side is sine, cos, and tangent. Well, I don't, I don't like that. So maybe what I'm going to do is, let's try. I'm going to take the right-hand side and I'm going to use my trig identities to first put everything in terms of sines. All right? Okay, so let's do that. So we have sine squared theta minus. Now, cos squared. So this is coming. So again, so don't forget. Sine squared theta plus cos squared theta is equal to 1, right? So that means that cos squared is equal to 1, if I brought this over to the other side, it's going to be 1 minus sine squared theta. So I'm going to rewrite that cos squared to 1 minus sine squared theta. Now I know it, it, it's, it's not the nicest here, okay? But anyway, so that's what I'm going to do. So that's these. That's first one and that's the second one. Now the tangent. Mm tangent 1 minus 
sine squared theta over cos squared theta. And again, I'm going to take this cos. I'm kind of guessing here. I'm going to take this cos and I'm going to rewrite it in terms of sine. Okay, so first, okay, let me simplify this first. Because if I bring this negative one, or sorry, the negative inside, so that's going to give me negative one and then plus sine. So it's going to be two sine squared theta minus one. So that's that. Okay, now minus, so minus sine squared theta all over. So again, I'm going to change that to one minus sine squared theta. Now everything is in terms of sines. Uh, I have a denominator, uh, which I don't want. So I'm going to find a common denominator for the whole thing. So that means I have to put this this thing over one, mon, one minus sine squared theta. Okay, so I know it, it looks like a mess. Bear with me. Sine squared theta. So this is over two sine squared theta minus one minus sine squared theta. So now everything is over the same denominator. One minus sine squared theta. But notice, this is exactly what we have here, right? One minus sine squared theta. So I might be on the right track here. Um, okay, let me expand this. So I'm going to expand this out. So like this. So I'll distribute across. So this is going to give me two sine squared theta minus one and then distribute this minus two sine oh my gosh to the fourth theta plus sine squared theta minus that last one minus this thing sine squared theta okay so these cancel huh is this right yeah okay so that's the identity so notice um, I mean manipulating this so this is 2 sine squared theta I mean I can rewrite it like this I guess minus 1 all over 1 minus sine squared theta which is your left hand side. There we go. So as you can see, I mean, sometimes it might take you a while, but these are the actual identities that you have. And I've manipulated to be have the left hand side equal to the right hand side with these restrictions right here. All right. And that was kind of the last one that you would play around with and then try to see. Now here they do ask us another last question. How would you show, oh yes, that's right. I, okay, sometimes in these trig identities, like what if a trig identity doesn't work? You know, you, so if I take this, switch the color. How would you show that an, an equation is not true? So a trig identity is not true. So let's say, I guess they give us one here. Like, is this true or not? Now, because these are all cos and sines, um, one of the easier things, if they do ask you to, like, for instance, sometimes maybe your teachers might ask you, show if the identity is true or not. As soon as they do that, um, what I recommend is don't try to go and do what we were doing in the previous questions. Um, then the first thing you should do is plug in a few values for theta, plug in, you know, uh, maybe so different values because remember it has to be true for all um, all the values right all the inputs theta I'm using theta it doesn't have to be the angle doesn't have to be called theta so what my recommendation is actually if you want to show so first if you're not sure first you know substitute sub in you know let's say values of theta now you can substitute the values of theta that we know about right 30 45, 60, you know, if you substitute these, so first, let's say substitute 30 into the left-hand side and then into the right-hand side and check. 
Do they equal each other? If you find that they're not equal, then obviously the identity is false. But it's not enough just to check one, right? So then now if they did equal, then take another one. Let's take 45 degrees, right? Which we know the values for sines and cos. Substitute it in and then check then. And then if you notice, hmm, while well, 30 degrees was equal, 45 degrees was equal, you can still try 60 degrees. And if you notice, okay, if all of these are equal, okay, let me try to prove if this identity is correct then. It doesn't mean that just because you substituted three in or two in and they're equal to each other, left-hand side and right-hand side, that it's always true. But it's highly likely, you know, if you substituted two or three times and you're getting that they're equal, all right, now I have to, I guess, kind of do the work. Because as a student, you probably will have a limited time on your quizzes or tests. But as soon as you notice that one of them is false, then you stop. Then there's no need to show the identity is false, period. Okay, well, I'm actually going to try to see if this one is true or not. Now, I, I don't think it is true because it says cos and cos times sine. And on the right-hand side, it says sine, sine times cos. Those are just swapped. And then they're dividing by one minus sine on top of that. So this can't be really true. Um, so I'm going to substitute. Now, I'm going to pick actually, f uh, f what am I going to pick here? Uh, ah, let's pick 30. Okay, so cos of 30, so that's 1 over 2. And so this is, you know, this goes back kind of to remembering the unit circle. I'll put up a link up above there for you, okay, just in case you forgot. So that's cos, um, sorry, cos of 30 is not 1 over 2, that's sine. So we have cos of uh, 30, which is square root of 3 over 2. All right, times sine of 30, which is going to be 1 over 2. Okay, that's going to be on the left-hand side. So this equals square root of 3 over 4. So that's that. Now, whatever. If you, if you forget your unit circle or something, you can take out your calculator if you're allowed. Um, you know, you can always uh, do that. Okay, now the sine, so, so this is sine times cos, so this is going to be the same thing. So this is square root of 3 over 4, divided by, now it's going to be 1 minus, now sine of, uh, sine of 30, which is a half, right? So that's just a half. So the right-hand side is square root of 3 over 4, divided by 1 half, which is going to be, so this is just a fraction, right? So fraction, this is just the reciprocal. So two goes into that, which is square root of three over two. Well, left-hand side does not equal to the right-hand side. So I just substituted one and I already can see that they're off. And that's how you can do it, okay? Now, if they were equal, then I could check another one, right? So you can check another one that you know and again, if you, if you find that, oh, again, it's equal, okay, maybe it's a true identity, and then you can kind of work around. But there is no guarantee, by the way, right? Ultimately, you know, if it's not true, then you will find something that it would just not work, okay? So those would be kind of the process that you would take. So this is the intro to these trig identities, and really, this is as far as I want to be able to take it. Now it's kind of your turn uh, you can go back and try these identities. You're going to have to play around with them. Some students like it. Some students don't. Um, I actually liked it Okay, to, to be able to play around with these. Okay, so thanks for watching and we'll see you in a future video. Bye, everybody.